All right, welcome everybody. I think we're gonna get started. Um, we are here today to talk about geocoding. Uh, and we're gonna talk, uh, or spend some time talking about um, Esri's world geocoding capability, uh, our online service, which is built into ArcGIS. It's available for organizations to use out of the box, uh, works with our desktop clients like ArcGIS Pro and ArcMap. Uh, the capability also works. Um, uh, for developers uh, who are building applications and maybe working with our uh, mobile apps and SDKs or working with our JavaScript APIs. Uh, and we wanted to take this opportunity, being that we're all here in Palm Springs, to just talk a little bit about what's new with, with our world geocoding capability. We are always working to extend the capability, to improve the capability, and uh, make it better. Uh, and, and in doing so, um, there are things that are new about it, and we want to share those with you. So if you're here for the first time, or if you've been working with uh, ArcGIS World Geocoding for many years, I think this is an opportunity to learn a little bit about uh, what's new uh, with, with our World Geocoding, and uh, we'll try and share that with you today. We will share some things that are brand new, um, and by brand new I mean have been introduced uh, to the service in uh, the last three or four months. And we'll also step back a little bit and look at some sort of major new features that we've added over the last year or two um, so that uh, you're aware of those and uh, can understand how to work with them. We'll also talk a little bit about some best practices. We've got a couple of questions that come up frequently to our team and we wanna uh, address those in this session uh, in case you know, you've come across those uh, yourselves um, through your own work working with the World Geocoding Service. Um, how, were any of you here last year at the session that we gave last year? Um, <laughs> So we've got just, just one. So there will be uh, some overlap with, with, uh, with what we covered last year, but we'll also introduce some, uh, some new things that are new this year. So I just wanted to just check and see. Um, uh, I always like to check and see. Um, so before we get started, I just wanna point out um, that there is a survey you can do uh, to submit your feedback about our session. Um, we're, we're interested in that feedback. We'd also like to learn if there's something you didn't learn about this year about geocoding that maybe you came to the conference and wanted to learn about. You can provide us some feedback about that. Let us know and then maybe next year when we do another session and we're preparing for another session, we can include some of that information in, in, in next year's session. Um, so the first thing I wanna point out is we maintain some resources that you can go to to learn about what's new, and those resources are updated um, at uh, different points throughout our development cycle. You can always go to the ArcGIS blogs and search for geocoding, and we post uh, blog articles about uh, new features and capabilities. We also maintain documentation for the World Geocoding Service. Uh, that's available online through developers.arcjs.com. And you can see at each service update, we're typically doing four service updates a year. Um, uh, at each service update, we provide some information about what's new. And depending on the update, there may be um, you know, many new things or, 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 or less new things, but there, uh, it's a good place to go and always check and see what's new with the World Geocoding capability. Um, and uh, these slides will be shared with you um, after the, after the uh, Dev Summit, and you'll be able to get access to these, uh, to these URLs and, and, and learn more um, and use those as resources. So the first thing I wanna talk about is just our coverage. Um, and the World, the world Geocoding uh, world geocoding Service um, now allows organizations to find different types of things. You can find addresses, you can find postal codes, you can find places, uh, by places those could be uh, parks or other, uh, other types of uh, common places, and you can find POIs, and you can also find coordinates. So there's a lot of different types of things you can find using the world geocoding capability. We're always adding new content and we're always looking for uh, new types of places and uh, capabilities that we can add into the system. We'll talk about a few of those uh, in detail uh, as we go through the session. Um, if you're interested in geocoding addresses, we now support address level geocoding in over 135 different countries. And where we don't support address level geocoding, you can find uh, other types of places. You can find cities, towns, villages, postal codes, and other types of POI information. So a very comprehensive uh, set of content that you can search against, um, uh, whether, whether you're searching um, you know, in, in your local area or, or interested in searching globally. Um, something new that we added 
um, for our content this year, uh, as we've been working with the community maps team at Esri, and uh, our, our, our group is now accepting contributions um, through the com community maps program for address data. And so this means that we've been working with a lot of local agencies who are curating local addressing content, and they're providing that to us, and we're now bringing that into our world geocoding capability. We, re we released our first community contributions for addresses with our December uh, release, our 2018 December release of ArcGIS Online, and we're continuing that uh, constantly. Um, we're gonna have another release of our geocoding capability coming up this month, and that will again have even more community contributed uh, address information. If your organization is um, you know, interested in learning more about this, or if you're an organization that's actually curating and managing authoritative uh, addressing information, we'd be interested in uh, working with you if you're interested in sharing that information and, and, and bringing that into the system. One of the benefits of that is that you can have your own local curated content that's part of uh, uh, an integrated and consistent uh, geocoding experience. Um, so that's new. That's new this year, um, and we're continuing. Uh, we're continuing that going forward, and we're very interested in, in in learning about new content and how it can can be brought into the system. Okay. So next, I want to introduce a new capability that we brought into the system um, uh, last year, and uh, this capability I think is very interesting from a, a developer perspective. Um, so if you're an organization. That um, So as I mentioned already, there's a lot of different things you can search for and find in the World Geocoding Service, um, not only from a perspective of different types of content, but also you know, a very broad uh, area that you can search across. So we've introduced this new concept into ArcGIS.com called a locator view. And this is the ability for an organization to customize the geocoding experience and be able to see results that are specific to your application. So if you're building an application and you want that application to be focused in a specific geographic area and not see results outside of that area, you can create a locator view that allows you to limit the content that comes back from, from the geocoding uh, capability. Um, and, and you can also um, have an ability to define results so that they just come back for a country. So if you're a national organization uh, and you just want results to come back for one country, the United States, or for Canada, you can use a locator view to limit that content. Uh, and then in addition, if you're building a specific type of application where you're interested in only seeing certain types of features uh, being returned, uh, you can uh, apply a locator view on top of the World Geocoding Service. And in the example here, um, we've created a locator view that just allows uh, somebody to find uh, airports that are within the United States. And um, so the, the benefit to that is if you're building an application that's focused on uh, airports or um, you know, aviation type um, services, you can uh, tune the results that come back to be specific to your application. Um, there's more information about locator views. Um, we did a blog about locator views when we first introduced it. Uh, it's been about a year and a half now since that first uh, was first re uh, released, um, but a lot of people are starting to take advantage of this capability, and we wanted to make you aware of it today um, so that your organization can benefit from being able to customize your geocoding experience. Um, and I think very quickly, uh, Brad's gonna show us a demo of uh, how locator views work, and, uh, and so you can, uh, you, know, you can see how, how, how to set one of these things up and how to use it. All right, thanks, Jeff. Um, yeah, so the first thing you need to do is just to log into the ArcGIS.com um, in, with their user account. And then um, first thing after you do that is go to content, and then you will have the ability to create a locator view. So you do that by going to this create button and selecting locator view. Now we'll give it a name and I'll do a combination of what Jeff just mentioned. I'll do uh, USA airports. Okay, copy that. And click okay. So now <clears throat> what it's doing is it's just creating kind of a template for the locator view. And then once it's created that, it'll give you this dialog that tells you now you can go configure it. So I'll click OK. Now we're already on the page where we can configure it. Down here on the bottom, there's this locator view section. So uh, first question it asks you is what types of locations do you want to find? Well, 
I want to find places of interest. And specifically, I want to find just airports. So I'll uncheck all these three. Then the next question it asks you, where do you want to search for your locations? Well, I want it in a specific region or country. So I'll type in uh, United States. Let's scroll up here. And then click it. And now I have both my airport POI and my region, my country, as United States, so I'll click Save. So once you've created the locator view, in order to actually add it to your organization, you'll first need to share it. So you go to the overview page for that view and click the share button. And sh I wanna share it with just the organization that I'm in, so I'll select that, click OK. Now that we have it shared, you would either need to talk to the administrator of the organization, or if you are, which I am an administrator, you can go to the organization tab, <clears throat> go to settings, and then you have the ability to configure you, your utility services, and in there, add a geocoding uh, utility service. So I'll add a locator, and you can see here that it's already populated, so I'll select U.S. airports. And I want locator names fine, uh, placeholder text is fine, or I could actually change this to, you know, find an airport. And I want to allow both geosearch and batch geocoding, that's fine. Click OK. Don't forget to save. I always forget to save. And once you've added it to uh, once you've added it to the organization, you can now go to the map and see that it just automatically adds it as one of the locators that you can search against. You can search against all the locators, or you can search against just one of them. So first, let me just show you. If I type in something like SEA, like Seattle, you can see SeaWorld comes back from the World Geocoding Service, Seafood, Seattle. But you can see with the U.S. airports. It's just showing us uh, the airports in, in that start with SEA. Okay, but let me just go ahead and just select the airport locator. And let's just type in LA, just another. You got LAX um, and some other things here. Or just lastly, maybe Palm Springs. You got Palm Beach International, Palm Springs International Airport. So. Just like that, we were able to create a locator view that just filters on airports for the United States. I'll pass it back over to Jeff. All right. <clears throat> um, so next we're gonna take a look at some of the feature enhancements that we've added to the World Geocoding Service. These would be uh, new features that you can access through the API uh, if you're building a custom app or uh, working uh, with, with the system. Um, and let's uh, let's get right into those. Um, so one, one thing we introduced, um, uh, recently is uh, enhanced uh, reverse geocoding capability. Um, so what do we mean by this? We mean that when you're reverse geocoding, you can now find results um, for different types of places, including POI results, uh, postal results, and localities, uh, including countries. And uh, th this, um, this, this is working through our ability to be able to leverage different uh, polygons. So in the past, when you were reverse geocoding, we were trying to find the closest point. Now we're actually able to leverage uh, polygons for these different types of features. And when you click in an area, we have a hierarchical set of polygons um, based on, um, uh, based on uh, how we've configured the logic. And what we're trying to do is return the most confident answer based on all the information. Um, so you can see in this example, I've actually clicked on the uh, polygon uh, for the convention center within the polygon area of the convention center, and it's returning to me, in this case, uh, the Palm Springs Convention Center, which is a POI, it's not an address. Uh, and in this case, um, you know, I have that uh, great ability to use the polygon or leverage the polygon uh, to return an address. Um, so when we do this, we're considering the hierarchy of features, uh, the feature type, and the distance, and we're trying to provide uh, the best uh, result based on uh, where you clicked on the map. Um, so not just returning addresses anymore, but also returning other types of rich information. Um, so if you're out in an unpopulated area and you're clicking on the map, 
now you might get a postal code or you might get a city or you might get a county or some other type of information which is uh, at least giving you some context for the, for the area that you're in even if an address isn't close to that location. So another, another benefit of, of, of the system and how it's improved. And you can see some of the different types of features here that can be, re, uh, that can be returned. So we're going to do a quick uh, demonstration of this, and Brad's going to show us how this uh, new reverse geocoding uh, capability can work uh, through an application. Again, you can access this um, programmatically through, through the APIs. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, so I'm going to just go through and show you guys um, a few different ways that we can return different results based on this hierarchy. So like Jeff said, you can right click on the middle of Palm Springs Convention Center and select what's here. And as you can see here, we get back Palm Springs Convention Center and it is a, a, a POI. So the next thing I wanna show you, let me zoom to a different area. I'll show you a, a locality. Um, so you can see here, there's kind of a bare area over here and I know that uh, there's really nothing around. So if I click in here, click what's here, I'm now getting Rancho Mirage as a locality. It's a city match. Um, so uh, to show you another one, let's go up here in this other kind of brown area just north of the, the, the 10 freeway and click here. And in this case, it's actually a postal, postal code match um, because that's the information that we have for that area, the best information we have for that area. Uh, the next is let's click right here on the 10 freeway. Um, what's the here, and uh, we have the ability to, to return a street name as well. So this match says just a street name of I-10, because there's no range information for the, the 10. Um, next, let me zoom in here a little bit. I know that over here, right next to this road, we have some good point address data. So right click, what's here, and you can see here that we have a, a point address match. And lastly, if I click right here on this Ramon Road, um, it'll be able to show you that we don't have a, a point address right here, but what we do have is it's gonna give you the street address information, the actual full range that's on that street. Um, so, uh, and it also gives you what the interpolated address number would be as well for where you clicked. So it gives you a lot, of, a lot more information than what we used to have. So go ahead and uh, pass it back to Jeff. I think he's gonna be talking about uh, the reverse geocoding parameters that we can use in the, the REST API and how developers can utilize those. Okay. So Brad showed you an experience where you can pass in a location and we give you back um, you know, the best, the best type of result based on that location. Um, but if you want the capability to be able to always return a specific type of result, so if you're building an application where you're always looking for the closest address, we now have a, a, a way to, re to specify what type of result you'd like to get back um, from, from reverse geocoding. And so we've added this new um, uh, way to re uh, pass in a feature type uh, for a reverse geocoding request. And you can see here that I've got a single location. That single location is the same for all of these requests. But I pass in a parameter a feature type in, in the first example of point address. And you can see for the same location, I get back the point address at that location. Um, but if I pass in a feature type of postal, I'm able to get back the postal code. And so um, there's a lot of flexibility here. If you're building a type of application where you want to get back a specific type of result, um, you can, you, you can do that uh, with this uh, feature type um, um, you know, approach. And you can see over on the far side here, um, at that same location, I asked for a POI and it gave me back the San Diego Convention Center. Um, we've seen applications in the past where an organization just simply wants to get back the country for a first reverse geocode request. And this uh, capability, this feature type capability, gives you the ability to be able to return back that specific type of result consistently um, for all your reverse geocode requests. Um, and and it, sorry, if it's addresses that you're looking for, yeah. If it's addresses that you're looking for, um, you know, you can, you can pass an address and always get back addresses. Um, and one thing I should point out, we added a new type of feature type um, with our December release, uh, and that feature type is called distance marker. Distance marker 
is um, a distance along a segment, and distance marker addresses are common in some areas of the world. Uh, Puerto Rico, for example, it's very common to use uh, distances, uh, kilometer distances along uh, road segments in order to um, represent an address. Uh, they might not have like house numbers on the buildings, but they have distances along streets, and we now support that as a, as a type of address that can be returned for a reverse geocode. Um, so let's uh, let's um, talk about um, another way that uh, you can use reverse geocoding to get back two different types of locations. Uh, and so what we're looking at here is a parameter um, for reverse geocoding called location type. Uh, currently in the system, we have two different types of location types. One would be a location type for an address where we represent a point either at the parcel centroid or on the rooftop of a building. Um, and if you have a use case where you're trying to reverse geocode and then generate uh, a location for that reverse geocode for the address which is on the rooftop of the building or at the center of the par uh, parcel, um, you can use the, uh, the street parameter for location type. Uh, and you can see, um, uh, sorry, if you're trying to generate uh, you can use the rooftop parameter for, for location type. So you can see in the, in the right example, I've passed in a, a location and, uh, and, and I've, uh, or I've passed in a location and I've uh, got back a reverse geocoding result where the location is snapped to the rooftop of the building. Um, and in the left example, I've passed in a location type of street and this might be the location where you'd pull up along the side of the street to do a delivery or where a, a vehicle might arrive in front of the property. And we passed in the location type equal to street and um, the reverse geocode request uh, gave us uh, a location for that address which is along the side of the street. So if you're building a routing type application where vehicles are driving and need to get to, to a location and um, you know somebody's clicking on the map, I think the you know using the option for street would be the recommended way. Uh, if you're building an application where you want to reverse geocode on properties and get back the main location for the for the for the address, um, whether it be the rooftop or the center of the parcel, you'd use the rooftop option. Uh, and there's more information about this on, on, on our developer site and we've got some more examples of how to use this parameter. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about intersection matching. Um, we've worked uh, quite a bit over the last year or two to improve our intersection matching. Uh, and so this means we've extended the capability of uh, the of, of finding intersections in our system to find more different types of intersections. Um, so we have the capability to find um, intersections where roads maybe don't actually connect or don't intersect, but they're close to each other. Uh, and But somebody who is standing at a location might perceive it as an intersection. Um, so these are roads that are close to each other. Um, we've also added a capability to find roads or intersections where roads pass over each other but don't intersect. So you can think of a freeway passing over top of a road or passing uh, underneath a road. Uh, and you can, uh, we can now, these are, these are where in the data the features don't physically connect, um, but we can intersect those features and, and now find those types of intersections. Um, and we're now able to uh, find intersections as well um, for um, uh, roundabout scenarios where you've got a roundabout in the middle and you've got three or four different roads that are coming into that roundabout and you might actually want to search for an intersection of two of the roads that are coming into the roundabout, but the roundabout itself has a different name. Uh, we can find those types of um, those types of intersections as well. So we've extended the capability for finding different types of intersections, and um, you know this uh, the, just wanted to make you aware of this that uh, our intersection capability has uh, really been enhanced, and you can take advantage of that now in, in uh, new and different ways. So another uh, capability that we brought into the system is um, we're always working on improving our interactive geocoding experience. Uh, and one of the ways to do that is to enhance our suggestions capability. Um, so we've worked on uh, adding even more um, you know, sort of capability into our suggestions uh, API and functionality. One of the things that we've done um, uh, recently is um, we're now able to uh, verify an address, the house number for an address when you're typing in information to, um, to our uh, Suggest API. So you can see in this example uh, that, you know, I've started uh, typing uh, 999 New York Street and there is a 999 New York Street in the address data. We can verify that 999 address house number exists in street data, um, so we're showing a suggestion for it. You can see in the second example, which I've highlighted, when I type an additional number, 
the, uh, and, and it now becomes 9,999. That does not exist in the street data, so we're not showing a suggestion for it. What we're showing is just the name of the street uh, that, that would be uh, most uh, in alignment with the information that you typed in. So this ability to verify the house number against the data uh, is, is another enhancement that we've made, and uh, it was based, um, you know, it was based on a lot of feedback that came in from different organizations. They wanted to know when an address that was typed into the UI really existed in the data, and they wanted to see a suggestion that was consistent with that. Um, so that's, uh, that capability has been added into the system and uh, is available to take advantage of today. Um, so Brad's going to show us a quick demo of how uh, address validation works in our suggestions capability. All right. So <clears throat> as Jeff was saying, the, we have a lot of good enhancements to our uh, suggest API. So I'm just going to go through a few of them right here. Um, so let me type in 380 New York Street. And as Jeff was saying, and I'm just going to show you the same way that uh, he was saying, so 380 New York Street exists in the data, as you can see here. Um, but if, and nine, nine does, 99 does, 999 does, but once you get to 9,999, that doesn't exist in the data except for in Florida, but we're in Redlands, so we, we, we didn't want that one anyway. So um, the next thing I wanna show you is that this isn't specific to you know, countries that, where the house number is at the, the beginning of the, uh, the address. So let me zoom here to uh, Spain where the house number actually comes after the street name and show you that it also works the same way. So I'll type in here, Cali, oop, Progresso 10, which does exist. I'll type in two. Um, 102 does also exist, but if I type in five, you can see now we're just returning street name suggestions in that area. Um, lastly, what I wanted to show you is some enhancements to suggestions for intersection geocoding. Um, as Jeff mentioned, we have enhancements for um, being able to have logical intersections and things of that nature, but another thing is that you don't need to type in all the information. So let me type here, actually let me zoom back to red lens and type in here red lens which is Redlands Boulevard, but I'm gonna exclude that, and New, which is New York Street. You can see here, I didn't have to type in the prefix direction or the street type, um, and we were still able to provide a suggestions for West Red, uh, a suggestion for West Redlands Boulevard in, uh, and New York Street in Redlands. So I just wanted to give you one more example here of uh, what Jeff was saying about logical intersections. So let's do orange and 10. So that's Orange Street and I-10. And if I actually zoom to it, you can see here that the, the I-10 goes over Orange Street. So it's actually a logical intersection as well. So that, that works not only with you know, just regular geocoding, but with our suggestions functionality as well. So I'll hand it back over to Jeff. Yeah, so one of the one of the reasons that was kind of uh, driving in this that us in this direction is we wanted organizations to be able to type as little information as possible in order to find the thing that they're looking for very very quickly. Um, so with our suggest capability, it's now possible to type even less information and find the thing you're looking for uh, even more quickly. All right. So let's talk about uh, another capability that we've uh, added to the API, um, and so. Um, one of the things we wanted to do is make the, um, the inputs for the API uh, more flexible. Um, so uh, in the past, uh, when you were working with our API, there was only a single input field for address, and you would have to pass in um, you know, the house number, the apartment information, and the street information all in one field. If your database had that in separate fields, you'd have to concatenate that information uh, together and pass it into that single uh, address field. Uh, but we've extended the API now so that it has um, up to three separate address fields, and you can pass in different parts of the address into those different fields. 
Um, so there's an example here um, where I have in my database a place name called Esri, a street number of 380, and a street name of New York Street, and I'm able to pass each one of those in in a separate field. And uh, sorry, and uh, the geocoding should continue. Um, you know, will 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 work effectively. So if your data is parsed into separate fields, we give you a way to pass it in in those separate fields uh, and not have to concatenate it together in your applications. You can see a separate example here where I've passed uh, different values into those same fields. In the second example, I've passed in um, the house number into the first address field, uh, the street value into the second one, and the unit value into the third one. In all cases, uh, those those will, will work to geocode. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility in the API and how you pass in information and you don't necessarily necessarily need to, uh, to sort of concatenate it together when you uh, send it into the system. Uh, so I want to talk about a new parameter, uh, another new parameter that we added to the system. Uh, and this parameter is um, allowing, um, if say, you, say you're interested in, in matching an address, um, and that address is very close to a range in the data, but maybe just outside of it. In the past, what we would do in that case is we would fall back to a, a street name match. And that street name match would put you in the middle of the street, and if that street was really long, um, it, 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 it might be quite a ways away from uh, the location where, where, where you were really looking for. So in this case, what we've done is we've added a new parameter to our developer API that allows you to match an address at the end of a range when that address is slightly outside of the range. Um, and so um, records that are matched with the match out of range equal true value um, now return a new address type called a street address uh, extension or EXT. You can see that in the geocoding result and identify that that record was matched using this approach. Uh, and you can see in this example here, I have passed in a value of 105 Main Street, but the street address data only had a range going from 11 to 99. There were no other ranges in the area that covered 105 Main Street. So rather than place this location at the middle of the street segment, we're now able to place it at the end of the street segment closer to the actual location where, where we would expect it to be. So this is giving us uh, an option to get a slightly more accurate uh, interpolation or placement of the address within that range. Um, by default with the World Geocoding Service, this is now turned on uh, because we believe that it has a positive uh, net benefit when, when you're geocoding but you also have the capability to turn it off uh, by passing in the vo uh, value being equal to false. Uh, and there's more information on our developer website about how this works and how you can take advantage of this capability. All right, so let's um, also take a look at another capability uh, that we've added into the system. Um, we have a language uh, a code parameter that works with our find address candidates, reverse geocode, and now geocode addresses capability. Uh, if you have address data, uh, you can see in this example, um, I have some international uh, address data, uh, and uh, I pass it in in that international language, and if I ask for the result to come back with a language code of English, when we have the data available, it will come back in that in that uh, in that language. Um, so, if you had a data set of maybe mixed language inputs, but you wanted to geocode all those and see the results come back in a single language, we have the capability to do that where the data exists in in in, in our system. Um, so, I think this is a this is an interesting way if you're working with international data and you're not familiar with the language to to see a result come back in uh, in something that maybe you do understand. So uh, new, another new capability, and that's available, as I mentioned, with uh, find address candidates, reverse geocode, and now with geocode addresses. Uh, and you can see some of the language codes that you can pass in. Again, they're available through our uh, developer documentation. Uh, so I also want to talk a little bit about um, our improved uh, POI search um, uh, capabilities. Um, we now have the ability to geocode tables that contain POI and address information. Um, so you can see some address information up here. Um, in the first example, we've got just a, an address and it simply uh, says Palm Springs Convention Center. There's no house number or city information and I can pass that into the World Geocoding uh, Service and get back an answer uh, which is a match. 
I can also pass in a POI. Uh, there's a Starbucks on uh, Palm Canyon uh, Drive in Palm Springs, California, and I can pass in all the information about that Starbucks and, and, and get a match. Um, and, but if I only have partial information for that Starbucks, I might know the name of the place and the address, a part of the street address, but I don't know the city or the postal code. I can also pass that in and, and get a match. And you can see in this final example, I've passed in just the name of the place, Starbucks, and the postal code. And, and as it happens, there are multiple Starbucks in that postal code, and I will get back the Starbucks that are within that postal code, and I will get back a status of tied. Uh, and so um, this is more flexibility for, the, uh, for, for, for your apps that you're building, and for, um, also for you know, batch geocoding uh, type processes that you're running, is that we have a very flexible uh, way that you can pass in a mixture of POI information and components of address information, and we can um, uh, accurately uh, return, return a result. Uh, and in the case, we don't require all the information in order to be able to do it. Okay, some other things we've added to our, our geocoding capability. We have extended our world geocoding capability to support MGRS uh, coordinate system. It's built in, out of the box, it's there today. You can type in an MGRS coordinate or you can batch geocode MGS coordinates and uh, you can locate those on the map. Uh, I've got an example here of uh, just a coordinate being passed in and we return back the latitude and longitude for that and we're able to, to locate that on a map. There are many organizations out there today that are interested in MGRS coordinates, a lot of national organizations that uh, can benefit from this capability. We have also worked on improving our geocoding of just latitude and longitude coordinate data. Uh, we now support, um, you know, some different uh, syntaxes of being able to geocode uh, degrees, minutes, and seconds data. Um, you know, for the longest time, we've been able to geocode uh, decimal degrees, uh, but a lot of times uh, organizations have information uh, coming into them that's uh, in decimal degrees, and we have some different notations of decimal degrees that we support now, and we're able to, um, you know, to find those. And um, you know, so organizations might be copying and pasting these from, from an email or from another source, or maybe their source provides information in decimal degrees, and we're able to match those and return the correct location. All right, so next thing I wanna move on to is I just want to um, uh, talk about a couple of questions that come up frequently for us, and we wanted to sort of um, you know, provide a little bit of guidance and give our, you know, our best practices recommendation for these things. Okay, so one thing that comes up quite frequently, um, you know, when we're talking with organizations um, is we're actually would like organizations to be able, or we would like them to authenticate their requests to our world geocoding service. Um, and so um, in the past, when you were doing batch geocoding, there was a requirement, to, uh, there still is a requirement to do uh, authentication, but some of the methods don't require authentication. Um, going forward, we're uh, recommending to organizations um, to, 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 to make sure that they're authenticating all of those requests. There are benefits in our system uh, to performance, you can get faster performance in some instances if you're authenticating a request. Uh, and there are also benefits to security, and I think this is sort of just a long-term um, thing that organizations are, uh, you know, not, not just long-term, but a, a thing organizations are thinking about today is, you know, we have organizations that are working with us, um, would like to see, um, um, you know, a high level of security with the system, and I think, you know, the direction that we're going is, uh, in order to help ensure that is for organizations to uh, authenticate requests. So, um, you know, we're asking organizations to authentic authenticate requests and the question comes back well how do I do that well there's actually a very uh, straightforward um, uh, web page that's been set up that walks you through how to do that for world geocoding when you're working in your app building your custom app and you need to make those authenticated requests to the world geocoding service uh, we won't go through the process today but I would encourage you um, if you're building a custom app or uh, to, to actually uh, take advantage of uh, this documentation, and, and, and it is what it says even in the URL, uh, geocoding uh, authenticator requests, and it's that straightforward. It walks you through a sort of a, a, a straightforward process to show you how to authenticate requests. 
Well, when, when you're authenticating a request, what you want to do is you want to essentially get a token um, and then be able to pass that token in with your request. And that means that um, we're able to understand who passed in the request and what organization was uh, passing in the request. So um, you're, you're authenticating yourselves to our organization and um, saying who you are and then we're, and we're giving you back a response based on that. And so when you're doing that, we're able to uh, ensure a higher level of, of performance and, um, and and, and security for the for the transaction. All right. Um, so a couple other questions that come up frequently. We have a couple parameters on our API that um, that are used uh, uh, that are used frequently. Um, one parameter is location. Uh, location is about defining a point of origin that's used to prefer or boost geocoding candidates based on the proximity to that location. So Brad showed you an example earlier, um, you know, and, and in fact, in all of his examples, when he was searching, he wasn't typing in a full address, he was only typing in a part of an address, but the system was smart enough to understand what, what, it, what area he was interested in and uh, what results to turn back and in what order based on uh, the knowledge of the location from where he was searching. So in Brad's case, what, he, what was happening was, you know, ArcGIS Pro um, knew the extent of the map where he was working and it passed in a location at the middle of the extent of the, at the middle of the map and it said, okay, if I'm just typing a generic term such as uh, Starbucks or um, you know 100 Main Street, if you also provide to me in your application the location um, where, where, where that activity is happening or where you're focused on, we can give you back the 100 Main Street or the Starbucks that's closest to the center of your map. So this is a, a, a this is something that if you're building an application that's focused on doing local search or you want the best results locally, pass in location with your request. Uh, there is another way to ensure results come back that are local to the area that you're working and that parameter is called search extent. Search extent is essentially sending in a bounding box of coordinates that limit any of the candidates to that specific area. And so if you know that your organization is working in a specific county or in a specific city, you can pass in a bounding box for that area. Any results that you get back to the API will be filtered or limited to that area. So the question that comes up quite frequently is, um, which one of these do I use? Um, or um, can I use the two of these together? And would I use the two of these parameters together? Uh, and what, what I'd like to say is, if you're working in a small area, use search extent, and you want the results limited to that specific area, use search extent. If you are working um, in many different areas, but you want the results to come back um, you know, ordered by proximity to the location you are currently working, use location. So um, use location in your app and pass in location. We do not recommend using the two of them together because you can end up with situations where you pass in a location, the location is outside of the search area, the search area filters out the results and says that the results that came back for location are, are not valid and you just won't get a response. Um, and so um, we, we recommend uh, that these are used independently uh, from one another and that they're used sort of based on the, uh, the descriptions uh, that I provided. I also want to make one other comment about search extent. Um, search extent really shouldn't be used for large areas like states or counties. Um, it could be used for a smaller county, it could be used uh, for, for, for a city, um, but once the search area gets very large, there's a, a performance implication because you have to get back all the results and you have to start filtering them. So there could be uh, you know, a slowdown uh, in the request. And if you make that search area very large, like the entire world, um, you know, that can also have an impact and uh, we found instances where, uh, where there are challenges with, with using these really large search areas. So really, um, if you want to search over a wide, large area, but you want to prefer results that are local, use location. If you want to search in a small area and you want the results limited to that small area, uh, use, uh, use search extent. So, uh, good. So I think that was the, that was the uh, other, other area that we wanted to, um, that we wanted to, to cover. Uh, and because these two areas, these two sort of areas of questions come up frequently, we get a lot of questions about authentication and we get a lot of questions about uh, location and uh, search extent. We wanted to provide some best practices. Um, 
Uh, how are we doing for, for time, Brad? We're good? Okay, um, so those were the sort of the, the topics that we wanted to cover uh, today about what's new with world geocoding. And we also wanted to provide some time to answer some questions and learn a little bit more potentially about uh, the types of challenges that your organizations have. Um, so we'd like to now open things up uh, for any questions. Those questions can be related to um, what you saw here today or maybe just your own work that you're doing today with world geocoding. Uh, and they don't necessarily need to be limited to the world geocoding service. If you're uh, an organization who's working one of, with one of our other geocoding solutions, uh, could be the World Geocoder on-premises version of the World Geocoding service, could be uh, you're an organization working with uh, StreetMap Premium, which is a sort of a regional version of our World Geocoding for, for, uh, for, for a country or a group of countries, or if you're creating your own locators from your own locator data and wanna understand how some of the things we talked about today apply in that context, we're also interested in, in, in you know, potentially answering some questions uh, in that area as well. Um, so I think we wanna open it up to questions. I think we have a microphone here. Um, try that out and see how it works. If anyone wants to ask a question, um, you know, Brad could bring over the microphone and you could ask it. And then uh, I'll try and repeat the question so everybody can hear it and then uh, try and answer the question. We've got a question up front here. Yeah, we work with a lot of utility clients and a lot of them have their own locator services that they've been using forever in their orgs. Um, and I'm curious if you guys have ever had folks say, we'd like to provide you guys with some sort of batch update uh, to fill the geocode, the, the global geocode service with information they've been collecting for a while. Um, okay. So it's not just community um, collected, but also from organizations like utilities. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the, the question is about um, an organization that's working with other organizations that are uh, potentially curating uh, address data that you know, would be uh, of benefit um, to Esri's world geocoding capabilities. And, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned the community uh, maps program and uh, the ability for organizations to contribute community addresses. It's not just limited to um, like sort of state or local governments. We have different agencies that would contribute um, through through that uh, you know through that approach, um, for example, um, you know university um, may, may have data for the university campus and may contribute that and, and be interested in seeing us add that into the system. Where we'd also be interested in looking at other sources of information. So if that information is coming from a utility or uh, other type of agency and that's an authoritative source of information, we're definitely interested in in, in considering it and, and and looking at it. And so one of the things that we do when we look at these data sets, we're looking for completeness, we're looking for accuracy, we're looking for uh, that authoritative source that's going to you know continuously be curating that information and improving it and making it better and, and, and providing new updates to us. So, so yes, absolutely, the answer to your question is yes. If you're aware of organizations that have that kind of data that are willing to share it and want it to be part of the world geocoding capabilities so they can benefit from it uh, directly um, through, through, through apps and maybe not have to host it uh, themselves, uh, we're, we're interested and, um, you know, uh, it, you know, as I suggested, the community maps, uh, you know, pages in ArcGIS online or in uh, Esri.com are the place to look for more information about how to contribute. Ownership on that data, I assume it transfers to you guys as soon as it goes up to your services. Uh, so there is a, a pretty, um, my understanding is that there's a sort of a, it's a pretty short um, sort of description that when you sign up for that program about uh, the licensing and how the licensing works, it's, I think it's about a two page long document uh, and you can go to the community maps uh, a program and, and, and read that document and find out more details about it. So, yeah. Another question? Yes, up front here. Hi, so uh, have you done any benchmarking against uh, some of the competing products like Pitney Bowes and Enhanced Geocoding Module or uh, Google uh, Google's uh, API? And the reason, we, we get a, a lot of feedback about, well, you know, we could found, find this address here in Google in Mexico City, but in Esri, it's, it seems to be locating it down the street and, you know, we can take those onesies and twosies and sort of look them up ourselves, but I wondered if you've done any uh, white paper or any kind of studies on uh, those APIs against yours. Yeah, so we are 
we are driven, you know, uh, our, our team is driven um, through feedback from organizations that we work with. And so, um, you know, I, I'm not, you know, we're not doing a, a benchmark like that against Google. We're not doing a benchmark like that against uh, Pitney Bowes. Um, but feedback comes into our team, like you said. You know, I, I, I tried it against this service, or I tried it against that service. Um, you know, our our strategy is more about um, sort of understanding um, address data. Um, you know, uh, at, at where, where we need to improve our address data, where we need to bring in more content. Typically what we find in a scenario where someone says they can't find something is that they've identified a location where we maybe need to look for or source more, more addressing data. And so that's part of our process is identifying these locations where we need to source more address data, figuring out, you know, what are the best available sources in those address data, or best available sources of address data for those locations and bringing those into the system. So, you know, my, my, my focus is to work with organizations to understand where they have a challenge um, and, and, and are looking for, uh, you know, optimal results. And then we're working with different organizations to source uh, even better, more detailed address data. Our system today includes addressing data from probably um, close to 50 different sources. And uh, that's, that's the challenge uh, today, is going out and finding those, uh, those different sources of information. We do document some of the information about those sources, um, and it's available with our, with our world uh, geocoding service. There's information about coverage, and you can go in there and see some of the different sources. And a lot of the information that comes into us will come into us from our distributors, from our partners, from organizations that are working with our geocoding, and they will say, look, we're working in this area trying to do geocoding. We recognize that there's a challenge, and so our, our, our process is to try and work with other organizations to figure out what's the right data to bring in in, in that location. And that's, that's really the way that our strategy works is it's focused on, on identifying a need and going out and, and, and finding, uh, finding the best data to, to, to meet the need. Yeah, question in the back here. We're using the StreetMap premium data, hosting it locally. I was wondering if there's a specific version of RGIS that you need to get this new functionality. Yeah, so the question is, uh, customer um, or organizations, uh, if an organization is using StreetMap premium, um, so uh, this, a new functionality, a lot of that new functionality has been introduced with a new set of locators uh, that, that, that we've been working on. Um, these new locators are um, faster, they're smarter, um, and we're now shipping those locators alongside of our classic locators, which have been available um, since uh, early ArcGIS 10, 10.x. So if you're receiving StreetMap Premium, you have access to two different types of locators, our classic locators and our new locators. The new locators uh, require ArcGIS Server 10.61 or ArcGIS Pro uh, 2.3 uh, to be able to do the geocoding with the new locators. Um, so you can continue using our classic locators, which don't have some of this new functionality, uh, and that works with um, you know older versions of, of, of ArcGIS. If you want to use these new locators that have this new functionality, then you need to be working with uh, a newer version of ArcGIS server and also ArcGIS Pro uh, 2.3. And I think it even goes one back to 2.2. One correction, it's 2.2. Yeah. 2.2, yeah. yeah. But um, so one of the things that I want to point out here is that as we add new functionality, it's not always possible to put that functionality into older versions of the software. Um, so our recommendation for geocoding is to always be using the latest software. We are quality testing, performance testing, uh, the latest software, and the new functionality is going into the latest software. So if we add some uh, new advanced matching capability uh, that helps improve the quality or helps improve the performance, uh, the latest software is the, the way to get access to that. Um, and, uh, you know, when, when there have been different times in the past where we've, you know, improved the performance of the of the batch geocoding by, you know, a substantial uh, number. And uh, in order to take advantage of that, you need to be running the latest software. So, our recommendation in order to get the best out of geocoding today is to be is to be running the latest shipping software. Yeah. Uh, another question. Uh, is it possible to set up the, the locator views in uh, the ArcGIS or the ArcPy or what's it called uh, the Python API for ArcGIS? 
Uh, so the question, is it possible to set up the locator views in the Python API for ArcGIS? I'm gonna maybe ask uh, Brad to provide a little bit more detail about the locator views. Yeah, so, whoa, that was loud. Um, <laughs> so locator views have to be created in um, either in, in portal. So the only way you can create them is in portal. You can utilize them in the Python API uh, by adding them to your organization like I showed in the demo. Um, but the only way that you can create them is by creating them in the portal, whether it be a local portal, and it's always uh, against the World Geocoding Service, um, it's, it can be a local portal or the ArcGIS online portal. So. That's, that's correct, yeah, it's only against the World Geocoding Service. That's, yeah, that's, that's correct for today, um, but if, you know, but, you know, going, going forward, you know, we'd like to extend locator views to even more locators and, and uh, you know, being able to use those with on-premises implementations of, of geocoding as well. Hi, uh, we're using a REST API to geocode with a token. So I wonder if there's any way to cap the credit consumption on the token. So we can give it out to developers and then not come back with like, you know, missing two, 3,000 credits all of a so, sudden. So the question, uh, the question is about um, capping credit consumption when you're using, uh, you know, paid geocoding uh, transactions. And there are ways today inside of the portal to configure uh, different limits, um, you know, for, for uh, different users within the system and, and limit their, their use. And so um, I, don't, uh, I don't have that information in front of me uh, right now, but if you wanted to spend a few minutes after the session, or I think there's also a way where you could go and visit the ArcGIS online um, uh, booth in the, in, the, um, in the open area and uh, ask them that question and they'll be able to kind of walk you, through you, walk you through and show you what the different options are. Yeah. Okay, so if, if, if um, the question was, <clears throat> we tried it one time and it wasn't respecting the limit, I think that's, a, that's definitely a question to take to the ArcGIS online team or the portal team and uh, kind of explain that scenario to them and what you tried to do and they can help walk you through that. And if there is an issue there, then it's definitely something that would need to be looked at, so, yeah. Uh, any, any more questions? Another question up front here. With the new address fields, address and address two and three, um, were those moved back into any older versions of the locators, or is that only in the, the newest version? <laughs> That's, so the question is about address fields uh, uh, one, two, and three. Um, those fields are available with, uh, with, uh, with the new locators. And so when you're uh, uh, creating, uh, we, and uh, speaking about the new locators, with ArcGIS Pro 2.3, we introduced a capability in the box to build those new locators. So um, there's a new tool in ArcGIS Pro 2.3 called the Create Locator Tool, and that lives alongside the Create Address Locator Tool, which was the Create Address Locator Tool is the way to create the classic locators. The Create Locator Tool is the way to create the new locators. You can create a new locator um, using that Create Locator Tool, and then when you publish that locator or you use it in our, inside of ArcGIS Pro, it will have those, a different, uh, those additional input fields that you can take advantage of. We did not, add those additional two input fields uh, to the classic locators. Yeah. Um, second question, real quick. Um, with the address one, two, and three, I know you're using those kind of dynamically. Is there any kind of equivalent on the rest return object for the address one, two, and three, or is it just the street address? Maybe a question for Brad. Yeah, so uh, the only thing that you're gonna, you're gonna get, um, the address parsed out. So let's say, you know, you're gonna have your house number parsed out in a, in a different field anyway. So there was no real need to add additional address fields because if you have unit, you'll, it'll, it'll show in the unit fields, right? So that's why we didn't do that. <coughs> When the when you mentioned uh, filtering by extent for the address locators, um, on the slide it said countries, but you said counties. So I was just wondering okay. if there was a so yeah. So <clears throat> there's a there's two ways that you can filter by extent. Um, one of them is to, to to choose a country. So you can choose the country, and then. Um, and only results will be returned from within that country. Another way is to define a bounding box or, or a rectangle, 
And so that's how you, um, there's a, a UI in that workflow that allows you to zoom in on a map and draw a bounding box. And when you choose that option, you'll only get results back within that bounding box. Um, so the two options are one, if you just want results for an entire country, pick the country. The other option is if you want results back within a defined area or bounding box, a set of uh, bounding coordinates, you can pick that option in, in, in the UI. And when I said county, I mean, you, you, you would essentially zoom to your county and draw a bounding box around it. You could search for your county, it would zoom to it, you could create a bounding box around it, and then you'd get back results within that bounding box, which is, um, you know, encompassing your county. Will the REST API expose that as well? The REST, uh, the, will the REST API expose that as well? You can use that locator view through the REST API. Um, your other option is to pass in those parameters uh, explicitly through those input parameters. Uh, so you can pass in, um, you can pass in a, a search extent as an input parameter and have your results limited to that area. Yeah, just, just to add to that, I think the biggest thing with search extent that we were trying to say on the, the third to last slide was, <laughs> it's really not intended for large areas. So, you know, if you have a smaller county, that's fine. If it's a larger county, like Los Angeles County, it might not be, yeah, appropriate for that, so yeah. Can you, I guess, I guess like, uh, like a province, like if I want to get, um, not just the country level, but maybe something more like a state here or a province or something like that, is there a way I can use a combination of the two? Like for example, you know, Ontario is a funny shape. So if I actually do a bounding rectangle, I probably get part of the US as well. Yes, yeah. So is there a way to sort of control so, that? So, so, so today, uh, today that filtering is based on a bounding rectangle. Uh, certainly interested in, in feedback um, where uh, potentially we could allow you to pick a polygon. Um, the challenge with the polygon, of course, is there may be many, many points. And when you're trying to do something like a suggest operation and typing, uh, typing things in very quickly, uh, and each one of those results get passed in, we need to interrogate it against a polygon. As the polygon gets more complex, there's, you know, more, more, more computation required on, on the back end. So I think we are interested in looking at ways where we could extend out that functionality to be more sort of explicit in your ability to define a, a, a boundary. Um, but we still need to work through some of these challenges related to uh, to performance. So. Yeah. So the so the question is, could could the sort of concept of country be expanded to a lower level of geography, such as uh, such as a region? I would say uh, y yes, it could. Um, but there are challenges with that um, uh, globally. Uh, we do see, um, well, you know, maybe in the United States and Canada, those regions might be um, what you would consider to be um, almost sort of uh, permanent. They're not necessarily always permanent. Uh, in the case of Canada, those regions have, have, have changed over time. Uh, and um, in other countries, they change even more frequently. Um, uh, just a few years ago, uh, for example, France went through a process of sort of re-aggregating many of those regions and recombining them in a different way. And the challenge with that is in the data, if some of those regions no longer exist and you're continuously passing in that same value then your request could be your request could be uh, broken or no longer functioning and so that's part of the challenging with stepping down to those lower levels of geography I think it even exists at the country level we've seen in the past where country boundaries have changed over time uh, there is uh, you know a change in in uh, the Sudan for example one that comes to mind and there's now a country of South Sudan and um, you know so, so in, in the data, um, if somebody was still passing in Sudan, but a whole portion of the data was now called South Sudan, you know, there's a, ch there's a challenge there. Uh, so, so as you get into these like more detailed levels of geography, uh, it gets, it, 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 it becomes challenging it, when you're building an app and you're kind of, you know, using that, that consistently over time uh, and those values can change. So um, I think, you know, thinking about it uh, optimally, probably a, a geographic area like a polygon is, is, is the way to go with it long term, but then, you know, we'll need to work, with some, work through some challenges on that side. Um, but, but certainly interested in looking at how we can do that because I think, you know, definitely organizations want to work within their boundary and not necessarily just their uh, polygon around their area. So. But I think we've taken the first step. We now have that uh, search area, which will limit results to a much, a much smaller area. So, uh, any more questions?
Good. Um, well, if we don't have any more questions, uh, we'll certainly be welcome to take a few questions up front afterwards if there's something uh, that you want to ask us uh, directly. Um, you know, thanks for coming to our session and uh, have a great uh, rest of the week here at the Dev Summit. Uh, appreciate your attendance and uh, uh, look forward to seeing you throughout the rest of the week. All right. Thank you. Thank you.